Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and today it is about community matters. As we come down to the end of this, what seems like forever campaign, <laughs> we are going to talk to William Bill Isla, who is running for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. That is one of those offices that doesn't get a lot of attention. And in fact, there are, at this point, six candidates running for an at-large seat. Three at-large seats. Three at-large seats. Yes. OK. So aloha, Bill. Aloha, Marcia. Thank you, as always, uh, for anybody that is new to us. Uh, I first met Bill when he was in charge of the Waianae Boat Harbor, which was the job I wanted. <laughs> but anyway, that's a different story. And he ran for governor. Uh, and what year was that? That was uh, 2006. 2006. And nobody knew who this man was, but he was running for governor. And his whole thing was to talk about the homelessness and the people that he saw on a daily basis working on the Waianae Coast, uh, and which uh, Linda Lingle won. Uh, but it, it brought the homelessness right up front, right the attention right up front. And she did do something about it. She did. There were several homeless shelters that uh, were constructed and put into place shortly after she got elected. So that was, it was a good feeling for me and the folks that supported me because uh, things were happening. Mm -hmm. there, there was a result to the campaign. So, and then since that time, you have been <laughs> former chair, Department of Land and Natural Resources, Commission on Water Resource Management, Native Hawaiian Working Group, past president, and on and on and on. Neighborhood Board, Hawaii Invasive Species, and tell me this, you were the head of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, as well as the chair of the commission? So the, the, the State Water Commission? As no, well but as I meant the one that the Board of Water, no, I meant the Board of Land and Natural Board Resources, of, yes. as well as there's a committee or commission or something within that. The, the Board of the Land Board. and Natural Resources is the uh, statutory leadership for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Oh, so, so you, were, you held both two positions. seats. Yes. Two seats, okay. And as everyone knows, he's Native Hawaiian, mm -hmm. and he is running for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. What exactly is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? The Office of Hawaiian Affairs was actually created by uh, the last constitutional convention that we had in 1978, but actually opened up for business in 1980. Um, it is tasked with the betterment of Native Hawaiians, um, and it's funded through the proceeds of uh, per rate of share of the ceded lands um, revenue. And so it's been around for uh, almost 30 years now, um, but what most non-Hawaiians don't understand is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs actually impacts everyone throughout the state uh, in terms of either having good decisions on how we manage the state's resources or the water resources because it, play, it plays an active role in um, participating on boards and commissions, but if there's not success, then um, it, through the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, will go to court to try to enforce some of the uh, provisions in the, the Constitution that you know, guarantees the streams have enough water to run and guarantees that the Department of Hawaiian Homelands um, has its fair share of water, as well as the municipal uh, bodies throughout the state. And so it's sort of um, 
an agency that has uh, oversight over how the state manages the resources for the betterment not only of Native Hawaiians, but all people in the state of Hawaii. Now, you mentioned Hawaiian homelands, which mm -hmm. you are deputy? Currently the deputy director. Deputy. So you have these two entities. How do they work together? Okay. Because the Hawaiian homeland is a department within the state of Hawaii. It is a state department that was yes. created as a uh, condition of statehood. So it was a federal program that was started in 1921. One of the issues that has sort of plagued it throughout the years is that when uh, Prince Kohio and the um, sugar planters and the ranchers uh, in Hawaii were lobbying the, the Congress. To 1921. 1921 to establish this program, there was a discussion about, well, who's a native Hawaiian? Prince Kohio advocated for anyone that was 132nd of the blood. The um, other side advocated for 100 percent. And so as things often occur in Congress, there was a compromise. And the compromise is that um, anyone that's eligible to receive uh, a lease from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has to be 50, at, at a minimum 50 percent of the native blood. And so that's caused, since the 1921, that's caused friction in the Hawaiian community and you know, in the community in general, because we have a State Department that uh, has to, by law, by law and by court cases since then, has to advocate for what we call the small N Native Hawaiians, the 50 percenters. So there's a capital N mm -hmm. and a small N. Yeah, capital oh. capital N is anybody with Hawaiian blood. A small N is uh, those with 50 percent. and Or less. No, or 50 percent or more is, is a small N. That's a small the small N, 50 percent and greater. The big N, I know it's confusing, the big N is anybody that's less than 50 percent. But it was not okay. <laughs> It was not something that Hawaiians created. It was something that Congress created. Uh, unfortunately, there, there are people uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C. mostly, but a few here who, whose desire it is to remove any kind of affirmative action programs for any indigenous people are using that and trying to couch the, their argument as this is a race-based program. It, it is absolutely not. It is the reason that the, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act came about is because Prince Kohio looked at what was happening to his people in light of the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and in response to that went to Congress and in response to him going to Congress, Congress passed this law, cementing a political relationship and not, not a, a racial relationship. Yes, and for anyone that understands Congress, he was a member of Congress, but he couldn't vote. Correct. He was elected, but he did not have a vote. This was a territory. Correct. And only people with states, come from states, get to vote. Even D.C., mm -hmm. they cannot, they have members, but they cannot vote. Even to today. Today. <laughs> yeah. So, what is the biggest issue, or what do you think is the biggest issue uh, for the Hawaiians today? And I don't mean the big, e, the big N and the small N, none of that. Hawaiians as a people. I can tell you recently with the appointment of Judge Kavanaugh to, oh, the, that's U scary. to the U.S. Supreme Court um, and his writings in the uh, Rice versus Cayetano mm -hmm. um, case, um, he is a strong advocate for um, the disillusionment of any kind of affirmative action for first Native Hawaiians, then Native Alaskans, and then they'll go after Native Indians. Uh, the challenge for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, it is a state-created entity mm -hmm. by CONCON. -Con. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands is a federally created entity, although what Congress gives, Congress can take okay. it. So uh, today, the, the, the biggest challenge for Native Hawaiians uh, in both programs, OHA and DHHL, as well as as all funding for uh, Native health, Native education, all of that is going to be challenged very soon, likely in court, because there's a feeling by the uh, ultra-conservatives that they have an advantage in that they have a 5-4 split with the court bending conservatively, right? right? So 
um, we and I anticipate uh, that you know there'll be some challenge um, to OHA first, possibly inclusive of uh, the office um, of DHHL and and other programs that will be coming out shortly, and so. The they, challenge would be the challenge if would we, be to the constitutionality of if, these programs. Okay, if we have a con con, would that be where? It would not because OHA was created by a con con. Right? I meant, but could the alt right elect enough people to? Oh, absolutely. That do would, away with. Yes, so they could overcome in numbers um, mm -hmm. the delegates at a con con, and then make all kinds of changes to. Uh, the state constitution, which could include gathering rights, um, water rights, water rights, the water code could be uh, called into play, labor, um, all the successes uh, over the last 50 plus years of labor in getting fair labor practices, all of those things could be challenged. Oh, that's so scary. That is so scary. So, um, what, now you're running for OHA. What would be your number one uh, issue should you be elected? What what would you like to see first? Okay. So day one is bringing back some civility to the board because we the board will have to operate in a very um, cooperative manner, uh, consensus building, in order to meet this challenge that's coming, this wave that is coming. Um, first have to be able to talk to each other, not sue each other, uh, and then move, move in the same direction, um, and start planning. You know, there has to be a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Um, the Native Alaskans have corporations. Um, Hawaiians do not. Um, what I'm do not, you mean, corporations? They have, um, they have village um, sovereignty, and then they have corporations that deal with economic development. Uh huh. Um, so. That could be a way to park some of the resources. I'm not sure. We need to have a uh, discussion with uh, legal minds that are much smarter than me on what kind of options that could occur. Uh, of course, federal recognition through the Department of Interior is another way that could um, help to uh, offset this, this wave that's coming because federal recognition uh, would indicate that there is a, again, it would confirm that there's a political relationship and not a racial relationship. The challenge is going to be, is going to be made that well, it's Now, the last time based. that came up, federal recognition versus um, independence and what have you, and there were a whole lot of Hawaiians that didn't want federal recognition, they wanted something else. How do you get past that, or does that still exist? It still exists today. Uh, there are folks that uh, have very strong convictions that um, independence is the way to go. Um, I, I think that that's, they, uh, they are certainly welcome to their, their position, but with regards to this wave that's coming, um, they're gonna have to make a decision, and the decision is, am I going to stand in the way of protecting um, these resources that come to our families, or do I put this, do, I, do we do parallel tracks? Do we do federal recognition as a way to um, strengthen and secure our, our standing uh, while we go and seek um, independence? So there's, you don't have to have one without the other, um, but getting them to understand it and see that has always been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge. So you will, but that would be your number one issue. My number one issue would be getting OHA, the Board of Trustees, in a position where it can actually have civil discussions uh, and be in a position to um, take a look at what options are available. Okay, well we need to take a break. Okay. And when we come back, we'll talk some more about what you, how you see OHA evolving from this point on. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov, 
I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner and we are back. This is Community Matters. We're talking today with OHA candidate Bill Isla. My dear friend, and you all know we only talk to dear friends. <laughs> okay, we're talking about OHA today because Bill is a candidate for OHA. Mm -hmm. Now, there are three seats open, yes. and we all, everybody gets to vote for three. three. We, we get to pick three people right. out of six yes. running for these seats. And so, let's talk about the biggest thing that came up yesterday was the Supreme Court and this magnificent instrument at the top of the mountain that's going to see all the way back to the dark stars and what have you, all of this wonderful stuff. However, there, the issue is this telescope is on Hawaiian lands, sacred, what the Hawaiians say are sacred lands. So, ta -da. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where do we go from here? The, the court says that it does not interfere with Hawaiian sacred grounds. Where do we go from here? What, what? what, what the court ruled was after viewing volumes and volumes of, of information, studies, et cetera, is that the TMT basically had met all of the requirements um, and in the EIS and in the management plans had mitigated or their plans would mitigate any um, negative impacts on traditional customary practices. And one of the reasons that they came to that conclusion is that the site of um, this current TMT, proposed site of this current TMT telescope, um, is in an area where there are no known burials, no known cultural sites. In fact, that's one of the reasons that after an exhaustive search of the mountain, um, that site was picked. Um, How long has it been there? The, uh, the telescope, the mountain or the telescope? The, the telescope. <laughs> so the telescope is yet to be built. No, I meant but originally. <clears throat> okay, so the first telescopes on the mountain, I believe, went up in the 1930s. Actually, Prince um, Kinkalakawa actually went around the world, saw uh, observatories, and encouraged um, folks to come and build observatories on Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, because he was a king that uh, was very much interested in knowledge, the gathering of knowledge, and that's very, um, I think it's very inside all of us as Native Hawaiians, the, uh, the science that Native Hawaiians bring to discussions all the time is based on observation. And observation is not just as the individual that's alive today, but observation is based upon five generations back where you get to talk to your great-great-great-grandfather and they explain to you about decadal cycles and things like that. But you were speaking of, you were on the Hokulea, early first? Nope, I, uh, I've had a few sales with Hokulea, never anything far. But you were, so that was all about being guided by the stars. It was about finding out who we were as, as Hawaiians and what it, evolved into is that we have all of these cousins across the Pacific and I think with the latest voyage is now we have all of these second cousins throughout the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean and uh, all the waters that surround the land and we're, so, we're all one people it, on one planet and that's what it's evolved to. But where I was going was that it seems to me that the addition of the observatories that can see, especially the new telescopes, that can see yes. way back before any time that we record, 
would be an adjunct to that learning that you are that you have gained at sea. And it's precisely why King Kalakaua went out and asked people to come here, right, to gain the knowledge, um, because he was a knowledge seeker. He wanted his people to be knowledge seekers. So, but we have this challenge of how do you balance right. tra traditional customary practices with modern technology built on an area that some people consider sacred. Of course, if you're not from the Big Island, um, you may consider someplace, someplace else on your island sacred. Um, but here we are today, the Supreme Court has made its decision. When I was the chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the board made the original decision to approve the uh, building of the telescope, and it was precisely for the same reasons, that based upon all the evidence that was put before us in terms of um, studies and things like that, <clears throat> it, it met the threshold to, to be approved. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a technicality in which we made the decision before a contested case was heard. That resulted in a, another round of um, contested cases, and then ultimately the Supreme Court took a look at this additional evidence that was produced and made the decision. So there was one, it was a 4-1 decision, so not, it was not unanimous. Uh, Judge Mike Wilson um, is the opposing uh, opinion, and so, um, but it is the law of the land now. It could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh dear. That's a possibility, or they could ask for a reconsideration. Um, no one knows right now, <clears throat> based upon press reports. The next step for TMT is to uh, bring its building plans to um, the Department of Land and Natural Resources to get that approved before any construction could occur. So we're still looking at, you know, many, many months more before uh, the first shovel goes in the ground, so to speak. So now let's move on to some of the other issues that are before the Hawaiians, like health care and prison reform and all of those things that all of us deal with every day. However, it seems, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that I look at all of the Hawaiians that are living on the beach and we're building $2 million condominiums right across the street from the beach. That, that bothers me and I'm not Hawaiian. But what about, how do we, I'm lost for words now. How do we improve the life of the Hawaiians? The health care, uh, there seems to me there are more of them in prison. They get bigger sentences for smaller infractions. Uh, how do we deal with that issue? Because that, that is, the, to, the way I see it, the biggest issue is the ordinary Hawaiians. So. For the Office of Foreign Affairs and what it can control, <clears throat> uh, these issues are very complex and very long-standing, right? So uh, one of the things that I would uh, do as a, a new OHA trustee is um, make a better case, build better relationships with legislators. So OHA receives about $15.1 million as its current um, share of the ceded land revenue. Based upon studies that uh, OHA has um, contracted for and information that we made available when I was the chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources as to what ceded lands are being used and for what and what revenue is being generated. The true uh, amount that is due OHA could be as high as $70 million. So having programs that deal with health, education, prisoner uh, reform as they leave prevention so that we don't have replacements is really a, a function of, re, uh, of revenue that you can apply. So by getting a fairer share of the city lands revenue, I think we could apply more resources uh, which would be more successful at keeping Hawaiians healthy, keeping them out of jail if they're in jail, keeping them from going back to jail, as well as continuing to promote and fight for uh, clean water and restoration of streams and you know clean air and access to traditional and customary uh, grounds to pick mile and and the items that are necessary for traditional practices to continue that is the the, what the, the biggest key right now yeah because 
um, what can I say, that uh, seems that, I, and I don't understand why the Hawaiians suffer more from diabetes and these other issues than the rest of the population. Well, I think poor people in general, not just Native Hawaiians, tend to have less access to fresh food and a higher quality food. Right? Poor people tend to go and eat the spam and the the luncheon meat and the you know the uh, Vienna sausage, right? Which is um, a function of cost, right? So if mm. we if we can bring the cost down of fresh fruits and vegetables, and maybe grow more taro, so people could eat more taro. Or grow um, more food, period. Here, right, in Hawaii, rather right. than bringing Shipping it in, in from yes. someplace else. So there's there's good movement to that. As a you know, a board member and the past president of the Ma'o uh, Farms, uh, a regular percentage of the crops that were grown, healthy food was made available to the community, and we need more programs like that. OHA can do a lot more in stretching the money that it has by partnering with other state agencies, other federal agencies, other county agencies. So going forward, you know, some possible ways of OHA stretching its money to deal with homeless, for example, would be to partner with um, Hawaii Housing uh, Authority, uh, HHFDC to build more units, uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to uh, reduce more people off the wait list, right? Because in any Hawaiian home that has a small N on the less, on the, as a lessee, you will find children, grandchildren, who are not the small N, but the big N. So the more that we can do for the big Ns to build houses, the more uh, the small Ns, the, the more the little Ns, the more the little Ns get to um, get off the street and, you know, Right. have a roof over their head and you know hopefully food on the table and so it's it's OHA DHHL and other agencies getting together that's the solution okay now I want you to look right into this camera yeah. this one that one and tell us why we should vote for you you know, I think I have the, I think I know I have the experience I know I have the um, desire I know I have the um, kuleana uh, to make things better for Native Hawaiians. I've operated that way all my life. Uh, many of the fishing rules and regulations that are in place, uh, I've had a, 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 a role uh, with, along with other people. Uh, Rain Follows the Forest, all of these programs that are you know, looking at restoring watershed so that in the future, as the rain gets less and less, we're able to have enough drinking water to go around for everyone. Uh, just, you know, my whole life has been uh, about service. And so the, the offering of this candidacy is uh, another step in that service because we are, I see rough times ahead and I want to be part of uh, navigating and uh, sailing through those rough times. Well, thank you so much. And well, good luck with this election. And we'll, you'll come back and after the election and tell us what you're doing. Okay. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Aloha, and we'll see you next time.